All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Ask Nutritionist Deepa. I am dietitian Deepa, and uh, I am, uh, as usual, back with my another episode of podcast. And this week, like every week, I'm super excited about our guest uh, tonight. And uh, because there's so much to say about her, and I just didn't know where should I start. But let me tell you, the podcast today is going to resonate more with women and young women because the condition that we are going to talk about is affects predominantly women so i'm glad that you are um, hanging around with me today i hope you guys are participating in some sort of a self-care behavior that i talk about every week for weeks after weeks um, but with, without much delay i would like to welcome melissa Boudreau who is a endometriosis advocate, okay? And uh, heavily helping women really deal with their endometriosis diagnosis. And we will get into what endometriosis and, and listen to her story, so on and so forth. So again, thank you for joining and uh, welcome, Melissa. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here today. Okay, so Melissa, um, endometriosis gosh so many women are affected by it uh, yeah. after hearing your story i did some research and uh, obviously one in ten women that makes almost six million women in the united states suffering from it which is a huge number so what is endometriosis what's going on here Right. So yeah, like you said, it's roughly one in 10. So if you know 10, you know, people in your life that, you know, may have this disease, they might be sitting right next to you. But endometriosis is, and I'm not a doctor, just so everybody knows, but it's a, it's a condition um, that where the tissue that's similar to the tissue that's in your uterus grows outside of your uterus. And what this does is it's kind of like if you think about a spider web or like a Laffy Taffy, first off, there's like lesions that can bleed every month and something bleeding outside of your uterus is your body is not reacting well to that. But then also the tissue is kind of like a spider web or like Laffy Taffy. And it really binds a lot of your organs together that are in your pelvic region. And, you know, those organs are supposed to be just loose and kind of free swimming around in your abdomen, so to speak. And yeah. if they're, they're stuck together, you know, something like your ovary can be stuck to your, your bowel or your pelvic sidewall. And, you know, a lot of people aren't familiar with how everything looks inside of the abdomen, but, you know, your appendix is down there too. So all of those things can actually just cause a lot of pain. And so, you know, endometriosis is a chronic condition. There's no cure. Um, the treatment is, you know, still being learned about every single day, but there's just a real lack of awareness, which is where I think, you know, the initial problem stems from is people just aren't really aware of this condition, but it, it's a very painful condition. And if you're, you know, listening, painful, extremely painful cramps, debilitating cramps are not normal. And that's usually one of the first symptoms. That, yes, uh, thank you for uh, mentioning that. And, you know, clinically, it, uh, you know, this tissue, like you said, grows into ovaries, intestine, uh, you know, in your fallopian tubes and, and the cramps and pain is, is terrible because our body looks at it as a, as a foreign object, you know, and, and it causes inflammation and long-term complications of endometriosis is obviously hormonal imbalance, but then it leads to infertility. And I have seen so many women uh, going through or have gone through the infertility uh, route and then IVF and the emotional toll that it takes on women's body and mind is really, really a lot. And that, yeah. that leads to poor quality of life. Yeah, it's a systematic disease. I think people just think, you know, you pop two Advil and you just have a few cramps, but they don't understand is this is a, a full body disease is how I describe it. Okay. So uh, then, Melissa, tell us your story as to 
when you were diagnosed, what you went, went through and what did you discover? How did you gain your health back? Yes, for sure. Thank you. Um, you know, it's been a long journey and I could talk about it, probably be a very long story, but so I won't go super deep into it, but please ask questions along the way. But, you know, I was one of those people that at a young age, when I first started my period, I had painful cramps. And I, I remember being with friends who just didn't understand because I was, you know, sweating and doubled over in pain and, and I had to go home, you know, if we were mm-hmm. at a friend's house or something like that. And this is very young, 13, 14, mm-hmm. you know, 15 years old. In high school, it started to get worse. And it usually only was, you know, the first two days of my period. So I found ways to, to manage it. But if I didn't manage it, and I was managing it just really with ibuprofen, you know, I, I found this regimen of ibuprofen, which was probably way too much for a young lady to be taking at that time, but it made it so I could walk, you know, I, I mean, the pain would be so bad that sometimes I would literally be riding back and forth. I mean, on the floor at at school in a bathroom. I mean, I thought it was normal. You know, I spoke to my grandmother about it and she said, I had the same thing. You're just one of those girls, you have painful periods, you know? And so in that way, it's like, it's for so many years, it's just been said that it's normal too. And I think that's part of the problem. But so I just, I pressed on. I just took my, I I found my regimen. I knew to plan my life around that week of the month. And I, and I hoped for the best. And there would be times where my period would come early or come late and I wasn't prepared. And those were the times where I was, you know, laying on the bathroom floor, almost vomiting from the pain. It was, it was really rough. And, you know, if you ask a few of my high school friends who still remember me, I'm 41 now, yeah. They will say, oh, I remember you that one time when you were here and you were laying it and someone's couch and so and so. And wow. you know, I thought it was normal. So normal. yeah, I went through through high school that way. And in, and in my 20s, I started to really have a lot of stomach problems mm-hmm. uh, in my early 20s. And I started seeing a bunch of GI doctors, actually. Sure. So, so I, I just want to... Yeah. Uh, Just one observation that even I have seen is the symptoms of endometriosis and irritable bowel syndrome and um, stomach issues go so hand in hand. Yes. And it takes sometimes so long to even get diagnosed with endometriosis because patient and the provider goes on this tangent of solving the GI issues. Yes. Yes. Endoscopies. I mean, I have heard stories from women completely MRI CT scan, <laughs> nothing yes. to do with, with, uh, with the uh, reproductive, yeah, absolutely. everything GI related, even some sort of, uh, uh, you know, like mental eval. I had a patient and the doctor thought everything was in her mind, you know, and she just has to learn to tolerate her pain. And hearing yes. that is also equally painful. This is why, I mean, the exact everything that you just said is the reason why I am an advocate and why I talk about it and why I've opened up about my story and created a podcast and just started doing all the things that I do because I went through all of that. So I started having these stomach issues, like you're saying, and I got to the point where I was literally only eating broth and crackers. Like, and I, I, one day I passed out at work and I was like, I have to see a doctor. So I did the same thing. I went to the GI, I had all the tests, the upper GI, the lower GI, drink the barium, do all these things. And guess what they came back with? You have IBS. Yes. And I knew my intuition, thank goodness, hmm. pushed me to, to figure that out. You know, this is in the early 2000s. And I would say like, you know, people laugh today, but Google wasn't what it was then. It really no. wasn't. I mean, it was great, but it's not what it is today. And so I remember Googling like IBS and be like, this is not what I have. You know, this yeah. is not what's going on. And somehow in all of that search, I found the word endometriosis. So I oh. actually self-diagnosed. I mean, I read the symptoms and I was like, oh my goodness. I was like, this is me. And so I did call my OBGYN and say it let's, let's have an appointment. I think I have this endometriosis and Mm. this is now I'm in my young twenties. I think I was like 23 or 24. Okay. And so now, you know, I'd already been suffering for almost 10 years at that point. And I did (laughs) tell my gynecologist, like I have these painful cramps and she put me on birth control and, and I did take the birth control for a while when I was younger. And 
Yeah. I just, I didn't react well to it. Um, my body, like I just, it was more like mental and emotional. I could not, I tried all these different ones and then I would have spotting. Yeah. I just, it wasn't for me. And I did do it for several years. I mean, yeah. I tried and, and it helped. I still had painful periods, but yeah. it helped at least slow my period down. So I go to her, she has me get a pelvic ultrasound. I get the ultrasound. Mm -hmm. Of course they find a, a large cyst. And they yeah. say, we have to, you know, we're going to open you up, give you surgery, see what's in there. And when I came out and I, again, I have no idea what I'm in for. I don't know anything. What I don't even know what the word means. Right. Yeah. I go in, I have the surgery, I come out and she said, I did the best I could. It's a mess in there. Let's literally quote unquote what she said. So, you know, I'm in my young twenties. I'm like, okay, I still don't understand like what is really happening. And she yeah. says, we're going to put you on continuous birth control. We're going to calm everything down. We just don't want you to have any type of menstruation right now. And I said, okay, great. So I, I did it. Yeah. And after about six months, I started to feel wor like the worst. Like, I'm so then the surgery didn't really help that much. No, it didn't do anything. <laughs> I think, honestly, I think it made it worse. I think I it made see. it worse because she was in there and she just, everything in there was already really angry. And I think it got angrier. And I was like, so all that inflammation. Yes. And I was on continuous birth control and I was in the worst yeah. pelvic pain of my life. And yeah. I just was, I, I really started to feel, I was, I think 25 and I, my friends are going to the bar and having fun and doing all this stuff. And I'm barely making, I'm forcing myself to get to work every day, drinking all these coffees, which again, inflammation, I learned longer. Yeah. <laughs> so I ended up finding a chat board. I get on that chat board about mm. endometriosis and I actually mm. discover a lot of information and okay. I find out I should cut out gluten. So I immediately the next day I cut out gluten, I should stop drinking caffeine. And I was like, oh my goodness, but I was desperate. So I was like, I'm sure. willing to try anything at this point. So yeah. I remember getting like my last giant Starbucks like mm. latte. And so I ended, I ended up giving up uh, caffeine and gluten and it did help relieve the pain mm. a little bit. I, I noticed a, not a smaller significant change. Sure. Um, and but so that would be because you probably ended up eating less junk. You know, sure. <laughs> that's, that's what probably helped yeah. you. I just ate like my, the yeah, my meals, day, which has laded with sugar and all that. Stuff. Oh, for sure. You know, and I was eating like a bagel every, the bagel was my lunch, oh, you know? Bagel. Like, of yeah. So, you know, you don't know until you know, right? Like, and, so and up, at that time you were still young. I mean, young. you are still searching answers and nobody's there to guide you. So yeah. And I was working retail and, you know, you just yeah. grab quick food here and there. It wasn't like I was, I wasn't, I would say necessarily like a terrible eater, but I wasn't the best eater either. You know, I wasn't really into eating like a bunch of junk food, but sure. some of the foods I were eating were junk, but I just think that they were, sure. but so I'm kind of how to balance it out. But I end up finding out that excision surgery is really the surgery that I need to get. And the surgery mm -hmm. I had was called ablation surgery where they actually mm -hmm. burn the top superficial layer off. I ended up finding a doctor in Atlanta. There's at that point, there was not that many doctors in the, in the U S mm -hmm. and so I was like, I have to go see this person. Like I was desperate. So you had to apply, had to write a letter. I did all that stuff, went and saw him, got the excision surgery. It went really well. It was nice to go to a center where they actually understood what endometriosis was. It was a completely different experience. And that's when I actually got diagnosed with stage four. Okay. So that was, I mean, I, my doctor with the original surgery said you have it, but she just didn't have the knowledge to really understand what she sure. was dealing with. And sure. so that's when I got the diagnosis and, you know, I had kind of a rough year after that. I ended up having a reaction to something with the surgery. So I had to have a second surgery in Atlanta mm -hmm. the next year. Okay. Wow. I had another surgery one year later. I, I look back, I don't know how I got through all of that, but I, I did. And then I did really well. I was still developing cysts. I was, I'm just someone who's really, and it, it's for sure probably hormonal because I have an estrogen, I'm assuming it's I have an estrogen dominant. dominance. Yeah. And so I would just grow these cysts and they'd rupture, grow, rupture, grow. And I kind of went through this cycle after those surgeries, but I did feel my day to day was better. Like I was able okay. to eat, I was able to, you know, kind of function better. So I was doing better and it would just be like ups and downs with the cysts. 
And then I ended up having a really large um, dermatoid cyst, which was a solid cyst. And if it gets mm -hmm. to a certain level, you have to have surgery mm -hmm. to remove it. Mm -hmm. So um, I went and saw a doctor. He said, you know, I'll remove it. It ended up, this is the craziest thing that ever happened here in Michigan. I, I couldn't keep flying back to Atlanta. So now, this I, is also another interesting fact you are just revealing that you live in Michigan and yes. there are so many women suffering from it and the doctor is in Atlanta. Yes. That's yes. a sad statistic. And that but was... Somebody was not able to find anybody or not... It, can't it happens all the time. Atlanta. That happens every day. I mean, that wow. was... Think about this. This was almost 15 years ago. Yeah. And we just got our first endo doctor in Michigan last year. Oh my so goodness. For, I mean, if you live in this state, yes, there are doctors, but the doctors that you want, a specialist that can actually yes. understand, there's a lack of education. And so, I mean, it's, it's crazy. So I end up having another surgery. So now I'm on my fourth surgery to get this ovary, the cyst removed from the ovary. Mm. And the doctor went in, I guess he said it was a mess in there again and closed me up. Hmm. Didn't do anything. He did nothing. That's what he told my husband. So it was a pointless surgery. That was wow. number four. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I don't so know what to say. I'm I, speechless now. I, I was also speechless and very upset. Um, but it, again, I try to live with gratitude and I was grateful that he didn't try because what if he would have injured me? And messed it up even more. Messed it up. Yeah. So then I find another fertility doctor. Again, I can't keep, I'm not to mention the amount of debt that you're going into because oh. your insurance only covers so much because these yes. doctors are out of state. I mean, yes. I'm grateful and lucky that I have insurance. If you didn't like, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it's really upsetting. It's really sad. So I feel very fortunate that I've had this opportunity to have all these surgeries. I don't know where mm -hmm. I'd be without, I mean, I would be, a, I don't know. I just don't know. Yeah. Um, so I ended up finding a, a fertility specialist, at least in Michigan, who has a little bit more knowledge. He says, you know, the cyst is like eight or 11 centimeters. We have to get it out. He mm -hmm. ends up, he says, oh, I do excision surgery. I trust him. He removes mm -hmm. my left ovary and tube because mm -hmm. he said that the ovary was so damaged from the cyst. Wow. I said that was fine. I, mm -hmm. I, I did agree to it before if he had okay. to. Yeah. So that happens. And then I actually, I still had painful periods, but I was pretty good for about seven or eight years, which was amazing. Wow. And yeah. then during this time, did you look at uh, exercise or nutrition as oh, yeah. other modality? Did you make any changes? I made a lot of changes. Yeah, I, I did. So in that time, I, mm -hmm. I started to research a lot more about endometriosis and, and how, what it was and we're still learning, but I also went and saw a natural doctor okay. and I got a bunch of blood work done. And we found out that I was also allergic to casein, which is an enzyme in dairy. Sure. So I cut the dairy out. So now at this point, I'm no longer doing dairy. I'm no longer doing gluten and I'm no mm. longer doing caffeine and I'm limiting my alcohol okay. at that point. And How about meats? How about meat? I do, I've, I'm not a, I was a vegetarian. Okay for a really long time. And then when I found out I couldn't have dairy, I knew that I had to probably add something back in. So I did add poultry back in at that okay. point. So I started eating chicken and turkey, but red meat, I can't, I mean, I can't even remember the last time I had red meat. It's probably been over 20 years. So yeah, I, I and that's just like personal preference. So um, it's probably helped me along my journey as well. And then I also, I did, I was always kind of an exercise fanatic, you know, fitness, okay. but I really started getting into yoga and, okay. and getting very serious about yoga and going a lot. And I noticed that it, it was helping with my pain. It did help with my pain. It helped me to kind of relax more. It helped me stretch, but it also made me stronger okay. in, in areas that, that I was not maybe strong enough, you know, it really helps with the core and the back muscles. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I was, you know, like I said, I did pretty well. And then in the beginning of 2018, mm -hmm. I started to, I started to notice that I was starting to feel like I was years and years previous. Wow. The nausea, 
I was getting very bad. Um, the pain was getting worse. I was having what I call episodes. And those are when you're rocking back and forth and you almost need to go to the air. I mean, when someone says pain level 10, this is like pain level 20. Like you, you couldn't get to the ER. You'd have to call 911. You wouldn't be able to drive. That's how bad the pain is. Wow. Yeah. So I had a few of those episodes. So I knew something was kind of going on. I avoided it. I avoided it because I didn't mm-hmm. want to deal with it. And then um, I decided to talk to a doctor and get some scans done. And um, we determined that, you know, endo was probably back. It had been almost nine years and, Hmm. and maybe it was missed. Maybe it's back. They don't know Hmm. enough about it. So I ended up having a really big surgery in August of 2018. And um, at this point I was so nauseous every day that I was not eating a lot. And I didn't, again, I think I ignored it. Okay. Um, I was in denial and I ended up, lo- I mean, I was just losing weight and just being like, I'm working out so much. It's great. And I did start strength training and I, I want to talk about that. Yes. I had a big impact on me too, but just in this surgery, I just want everyone to know I was so nauseous, so nauseous. I had a large cyst and sometimes cysts can make you feel nauseous. When they got in there, I had almost a full bowel obstruction from endometriosis. Goodness. It had attacked my, between my large and small intestine. And Mm -hmm. I literally was like a science experiment in the hospital because it was so severe. They couldn't believe that I was surviving every day and they couldn't believe that I wasn't vomiting every day. They they literally couldn't believe that I was functioning. And I, at that point had a job where I was traveling every week. I was crazy. Life was really, and I was just push, 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 push right through it. Yeah. And that was a very hard recovery. But with strength training that I just want to push in here really quick was a few years prior, maybe two or three years, I had started strength training. But I started strength training because I had gained some weight and it really changed my recovery. I can't speak about it enough because in the other surgeries, I couldn't get out of bed for days. I couldn't go to the bathroom by myself. This surgery, which was a major, major surgery, I was in the hospital for seven days. I was able on the second day to be able to get up and use the restroom on my own. And I know that's because I strength trained and used weights to strengthen my body. So when you say strength training, it means just weights or any protocol? Yeah, like lifting weights. um, If people are looking for, you know, starting strength, I think is a website, startingstrength.com. But yeah, just, I actually stopped doing crazy cardio and I started doing regimens for specifically weight training my legs and arms and you know kind of like Arnold Schwarzenegger type of stuff but but more a weight that I could handle for you know my size and frame and then I would work on increasing my weight every week and I just I really started to get very strong which I don't think I ever was and it it really made an impact on that recovery that was a huge I think so because I think this one of the uh uh negatives of surgeries in general and speci- specifically related to the um, the uh, you know the reproductory system is lack of core you know women yes. lose their core strength which leads to lack of balance too so so having that strength back and it's not only strengthening like getting m- m- big muscles but also strengthening the muscles within you yes. like your abdominal muscles and you know your other muscles in your um, system to strengthen it because imagine the amount of trauma uh, that your body went through cutting yes. it open switching you know yeah. sticking it back all that stuff takes toll on you and it's like tearing tearing your body apart and trying to fix it yes yes oh, wow. that was, so i was really happy that I had started to do that. And, you know, with inflammation too, I found that strength training was much easier on my body than doing spinning or running or or high impact cardio, you know, strength training is a slower movement. And I just, I, I felt better before and after from doing it. So it took me about, I would say eight months to feel almost normal from that surgery. It It was a big one. Okay, so yeah. that in, in your case, uh, finding the right doctor, getting through that surgery, and making some dietary changes, and then 
finding the strength training kind of led you to your um, recovery, uh, I may say. And then, um, have you ever looked at plant-based diets, anything like that, to to uh, avoid the relapse? Yeah. So. I have looked at that. I think for me, one of the things I struggle with, with the strength training is I really like to have a lot of protein yes. and I do not digest beans well. Okay. And so I don't know how else I'm going to achieve, you know, I want to eat between 80 and hundred grams of protein a day. That's kind of my goal. I don't know how else to achieve that. I mean, I drink plant-based protein shakes. I do have that, but that can't be my only source of protein. So I think I would do that because, you know, I still struggle with nausea here and there. And yeah. you know what doesn't sound good to me when I'm nauseous? A chicken breast. Yes. It's just, it just yeah. I want it to, but it just, it doesn't. I really struggle with it. That, that is true because there's a lot of research coming out and uh, I've seen it with my patients is anytime there is a hormonal imbalance and, you know, anything going wrong along those lines, plant-based really helps because animal protein, obviously you are, along with the protein, you are also getting the hormones yeah. which are interfering with what you are already suffer, suffering with. So maybe you and I can have a separate discussion and get you on the path of, uh, uh, of, of plant-based uh, some other time. But I just wanted to also listener know that you thought about it and it just you know, with maybe with little support and um, education, that is another uh, viable treatment option. Yeah, I, you know, just a quick chime in. I actually have a friend who has um, a carcinoid cancer in her lung, and she did switch to plant based. Yes. And she said it, it it changed everything for her. Yes. So just you know, I don't have a personal experience, but I I try to avoid meat. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, I know that uh, somehow you, you you got into different, you know, businesses, you can say, or projects, you can, uh, you may say, tell us a little bit about your podcast, your bar line, uh, which yes. sounds very intriguing, your advoca advocacy in, in, uh, in yes. the area of endometriosis, kind of help us understand okay. all different hats you do and how you I do I wear a lot of hats. I'm a very passionate person, you know, regardless of suffering through some pain. I do think endometriosis has shaped me into the person I am, and it makes me really want to fight for other people, hence the advocacy. Um, I do want to mention, though, really quick before I go into that, acupuncture, too, has been very, very helpful for me. So for anyone who's listening, that's just, if you have chronic pain or you have endo, definitely look into that, and don't be scared of it. Um, but for me, you know, I started advocating probably 10 years ago, 11 years ago for endometriosis, you know, I was nervous to open up about my story. So I really only my close friends knew. And then as the years went on, I just started posting on social media. I just started talking about it. I just started telling my story and someone would be like, Oh, my daughter, it sounds like she has that. Or someone from a company I worked at would say, I think my sister has it. And I realized that talking about my story actually had impact. And I said, I have to I have to start to get the word out. You know, I'm not, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a medical professional, but I've been through a lot and I, I probably know more than someone who's starting their journey. So how can I do some things to prevent people from suffering as long as I have? So I started a podcast about it. It's called the cycle and this is podcast anywhere where podcasts are, li you can listen to. And most of the podcasts are just people telling their story, just like I did today. But then we'll talk about ways that what's worked for them you know, endometriosis seems to affect everybody differently. And that's part of the problem too. There's just so many unknowns. So hearing all these other stories and what it feels like and what the symptoms are and mm -hmm. what they may have tried to, you know, suppress their symptoms, I think is very helpful for the community. So that's one thing I do. I like to do fundraising and raise money for the Endometriosis Foundation, yeah. America, which very excitingly, I actually just started a position there because I, it's COVID and I lost my job during COVID. Okay. And so I started part-time working for the foundation because I'm so passionate about it. Mm -hmm. And then I also launched a protein bar a couple of years ago. So in 2017, like mm -hmm. we were just talking about, 
yes. I really wanted to get more protein in my life and I couldn't find anything that worked with me, with my endo, with my inflammation and all of that. So, you know, for anyone who's watching, whoever's listening, you won't be able to see, but you can see I have it fits bar. It fits and, bar. Yeah. And it's vegan and gluten free and yeah. dairy, obviously dairy free because it's vegan. <laughs> And I try to, you know, have very clean ingredients yeah. because mm -hmm. that's, you know, the whole point of trying to eat healthy and well, especially when you have chronic illness, is avoiding inflammation. Correct. And so eating anything that could cause that inflammation and cause a flare-up, it's just not worth it to me. You know, sure. it's really not worth it. And one thing, I also only have like maybe one glass of wine a month yeah. now. I just, mm -hmm. unfortunately, I just don't tolerate alcohol and I love a beautiful, delicious sure. wine or a cocktail, but it's just not worth it for, the, for yeah. how I feel. So um, yeah, it fits bar.com. If you want to check that out or on Instagram, I do that. And then um, I used to work in the cinema industry. That's the job I lost. Unfortunately, I was a chief marketing officer, but the good news is, is I'm still on a board for women in exhibition and I do a little consulting still in the movie space too. So okay. I, it's, I'm very busy, but you know, slowing down in self-care is something I've really, really learned over the past couple months and meditation has been huge for me as well. So absolutely. No, thank you for sharing that because, um, Another point I want to drive home with the audience is, uh, as, as women, you know, we wear a lot of hats and we have our professional ambitions and then we have family and, and uh, you know, these unique industries that you have been working in. So you are busy, but if we don't take care of ourselves, we are not good, good caretakers we are not good, um, we don't perform to, uh, to our fullest because I think we have so much potential. We are talented. Our brain is wired differently to do uh, things in certain ways, but we always put ourselves or women always put themselves at the back of the line because everything else takes priority. Oh, you know, my boss needs this. Oh, my business needs this. My family needs this. And you are a mother and a daughter and a friend and everything first. And um, I have counseled women over the years by saying, let's be selfish a yes. little bit. You know, it's okay. It's okay if we tell everybody, just give me 15 minutes to breathe and take care of myself and eat something worthwhile and then the energy that comes from it really feeds we can do we can take care of 100 other people yeah you know 100 percent, 100 percent. i heard someone once say if your cup is empty you shouldn't be trying to fill anybody else's wait until your teacup is overflowing and then i, I thought that that was a great it's a, such a true analogy it is true analogy because you know with the modern lifestyle things have just gotten or um, they just everything was so we were into this very speedy uh, uh, level you know like a very high high going high energy on a highway here mm -hmm. uh, going at 100 miles an hour without really taking pauses and and breaks for ourselves so I'm glad that in spite of you being professionally so busy you are taking care of yourself yeah <laughs> and really and sharing that with with other uh, with others so um usually we give away a recipe uh, that our podcast host you know likes to share or anything that has benefited them but in your case uh, i'm just going to go and go and visit your uh, your bar website it's called uh, itfitsbar.com and yep we so we are relaunching too so we took a little okay. bit of a break mm -hmm. and we are going to have product in about a month but yes itfitsbar.com and okay. hopefully everybody checks it out and you enjoy it exactly so that's going to be our recipe that's going to be your gift to us is your it fits bar because i'm i'm kind of i myself is curious to see what it has and uh, uh, you know, the mocha flavor, chocolate, mocha chocolate flavor looked really good. So uh, <laughs> they're good. They are. Yeah. Especially if you are trying to wean off of real caffeine, then having yeah. a small fix like that 
would be wonderful. So, um, yeah, I guess um, that's it. If you have anything else to share or uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with you or learn more about you, your journey, uh, where, where can they find you? Sure. They can just go to my website. It's melissaboudreau.com. Very easy. If you want to find me on social media, everything's linked there on my website. So feel free to reach out if you are struggling with endo and you just, I'm not a doctor, but if you just need someone to ask a couple of questions to, I'd be happy to help you. Um, I just, I'm here to serve and, and bring advocacy to this disease. Okay, no, th thank you, Melissa, for your time. And uh, we will have Melissa's contact information, social media information uh, listed in the podcast, podcast notes, as well as, you know, as everybody knows, this podcast is also, you can watch the podcast on YouTube, so you can find it there, or you can always get hold of me um, uh, at deepa at nutritionisdeepa.com, and uh, I will get it to you. Um, again, everyone, Please, 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 uh, I hope you have learned one thing, two things, something from, from this conversation. That's the whole point of uh, getting these wonderful guests is to, is to educate everybody and, and really drive home the message of self-care uh, through fitness, through nutrition, through mindfulness, through yoga, through acupuncture, and uh, really making, making uh, improving the quality of life for all of us and, and the ultimate happiness that comes from it. So thanks again, everybody. And um, I will be back next week with uh, some other goodie in my back. So take care and I will uh, talk, to, talk to you soon.